Welcome to PGOG Postgraduate Class in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And today's topic uh, is Abnormal Uterine Bleeding Part 2. Here we will see palm coin classification system. Recent advances will also be included in that. Now the recent advances, if we see, uh, if the first uh, introduction of this palm coin classif classification system, it took uh, place in 2011. And it was called as, uh, it is still called as FIGO AUB System 1 and System 2. FIGO is International Federation of Gynecologists and Obstetricians, that is the OPEX body. And that body introduced this uh, new classification system for the, to study or to even uh, clinically uh, uh, evaluate the patients, treat the patients. And that is called as AUB System 1 and AUB System 2. Last class, we have already seen about AUB system one in AUB part one. Next came WHO classification of endometrial hyperplasia in 2014. Then there was FIGO AUB revised classification in 2018. So it is an important landmark that whatever was suggested in 2011, major content is same, but few modifications are there. And that is why it is very relevant for us to know about this uh, revision of the uh, AUB system 2, uh, which, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which uh, was introduced in 2018. Then uh, most uh, latest one is the AUB O subclassification by FIGO in 2022. And in 2000, as recent as 2023, we have FIGO staging of carcinoma endometrium. This we have already seen and I have just taken a slide from the previous class only where in AUB part 1 we have already seen this AUB system which is mainly focusing on how we take menstrual history by FDRV and then about intermenstrual bleeding and about the unscheduled bleeding. So what we, are, we will see today mainly is FIGO AUB system 2 that is palm coin it is an etiological classification of abnormal uterine bleeding. First four are structural uh, causes or contributors for the abnormal uterine bleeding, uh, which can, which are, which are measurable, which can be measured or evaluated either by imaging or by histopathological examination. So we have polyp, adenomyosis, leomyoma, and remember M is not only malignancy, it is malignancy and hyperplasia. Next four are called as non-structural because these, these uh, uh, pathologies cannot be measured or evaluated by imaging or histopathology. So we have here coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial disorders, and iatrogenic. Uh, now, all the uh, new, old terminology was dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which was discarded by this AUB in 2011, AUB system one and system two. But if uh, we see what we can recognize here is DUB included all these three, coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, and endometrial disorders. Last is not otherwise classified because it is it, it can be either structural or non-structural. Now starting with first that is AUBP is abnormal trend reading poly where there is a where we have identified polyp. So polyp can be either endometrial or endocervical polyp. Polyps are the epithelial Oh, overgrowths which contain variable amount of vascular tissue, connective tissue or fibrous tissue. These are often asymptomatic. Though these are detected, it is not necessary that always these will always be necessarily be contributing to AUV, but these might contribute to AUV, especially if patient has intermenstrual uh, bleeding, then it might be because of this polyp. These are usually benign and rarely they, these are atypical or malignant, but it is a dictum that whatever tissue we remove, we send it for histopathology and it comes sometimes uh, as a surprise that it might be a malignant polyp, but it is very rare. These are diagnosed either by ultrasonography, better by hysteroscopy, and whenever we 
remove this, then by confirmation is by histopathological examination. Next is AUB adenomyosis. Now, how much it contributes for the abnormal uh, uterine bleeding is still not clearly known. And it is a disease which has recently got attention by all the uh, educators and researchers. And still, there are so many queries related to that. It is If it is diagnosed histopathologically as a hysterectomy specimen, that diagnosis is of less value as far as uh, palm coin classification system goes because palm coin is a pre-operative clinical classification system. It helps us to know how many uh, contributing causes are there and how to manage a patient. And hysterectomy is too drastic uh, treatment for abnormal uterine bleeding and that is why we need to diagnose it by measures apart from histopathological examination and for that ultrasonography and MRI based diagnostic criteria are very important. 2D transvaginal sonography is considered to be having same specificity and sensitivity as uh, MRI as far as diagnosis of uh, uh, AUBA goes, adenomyosis goes. Now these are the eight criteria. I have specifically uh, kept one uh, diagram as uh, not already drawn because I want you to uh, learn how to draw the uterus. It is a now this is a longitudinal section, and here we need to draw the uterus. So what we need to do here is just a minute. We need to draw first this triangle, small triangle that is a uterine cavity and this is a longitudinal section so we draw it like that and because this is asymmetrical myometrial thickness what I am showing is here it is thicker as compared to this part. So that is how we need to uh, draw all these eight. So I, my request to all the postgraduates is you practice drawing this longitudinal section of the uterus so that it is easier for you to show these diagnostic criteria. First is asymmetrical myometrial thickness. You can see it is thicker here as compared to this part. Myometrial cyst. Now, whenever we say cyst, fluid free field cavities on ultrasonography will always look black. And that is why you need to draw it as black fluid field cavities, myometrial cyst, presence of myometrial cyst. Hyperechoic. Now, whenever any lesion is hyperechoic, it will look dark or white in color. It will stand out as very uh, stark white in color. So, these are hyperechoic islands. Fan shaped shadowing can be seen. Then, there can be subendometrial lines and birds that these can be seen. In the lesion itself, we can see the vascularity. And these last two are related to the junctional zone here here we can see regular junctional zone and here we, we can see interrupted junctional zone so all the postgraduates must remember these eight diagnostic criteria which are uh, possible either by doing a 2d uh, transvaginal sonography or by with by doing a uh, mri remember that for this last two junctional zone 3d ultrasonography is said to be better Anytime there are more, more two or more than two criteria are present, it is sufficient for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. So this, how I remember this is two are related to junctional zone. There is one related to the vascularity, and one is asymmetrical myometrial thickness. Four are remaining. One is cyst, other is hyperechoic, one is fan shaped, and last is lines and birds. So you also have. Uh, develop some system of how you remember these eight, but you need to remember these eight criteria. Sub classification of adenomyosis is likely is likely to come in future. So that such as whether it is a generalized adenomyosis or whether it is a focal or multifocal, and how much uh, part of the uterus is involved, that is likely to come in future. At present, there is no such classification available. At present, AUB, either you say adenomyosis present or you say adenomyosis absent. Now, next is leomyoma, AUBL. There are three subclassifications which were introduced right in 2011. Primary is whether leomyoma is present or not. 
second classification is whether it is a submucus or others are, are labeled as by o o is others that, that is non submucus most uh, symptomatic are submucus and that is why this division has been made in secondary classification tertiary classification is where there are 0 to 8 types and there is one more which is also called as a hybrid leomyoma now all these this tertiary classification it is important especially whenever we are planning uh, removal of the leomyomas myomectomy to be done either by with the help of laparoscopy or hysteroscopy so as you can see here type 0 is where pedunculated submucous leomyoma is there one is less than 50% is in the myometrium two is more than or equal to 50% is in the myometrium three is completely in the myometrium but it is touching the endometrial lining four is really what we say as a intramural which is neither touching the endometrium nor serosa five is where it is projecting uh, beyond the serosa but major component is still in myometrium more than or equal to 50 percent is in myometrium six is less than 50 percent in myometrium and seven is a pedunculated subserous leomyoma eight is others such as there can be a parasitic one or there can be a cervical fibroid the, that comes under eight eight what is hybrid is this is an example of two to five that is uh, two is whenever it is a uh, more than or equal to 50 percent is in the myometrium and here it is five five is again more than or equal to 50 percent in myometrium so it is a huge one which is going from right from here to the beyond serosa so in that, these cases there is a first digit is towards the <clears throat> relationship to the endometrium and next digit digit is its relationship with the serosal surface so that is why it is called as two to five this is one example of a hybrid now as far as 2011 classification goes 0 1 and 2 were considered as submucus 3 and 4 as intramural and 5 6 7 as subserous but important modifications especially are seen in 2018 related to AUBL the modifications which are uh, there are type 3 is included in submucus because it is so it is mainly in the myometrium it is touching the endometrium and it is included in the submucus with the sense that hysteroscopic removal uh, can, can be tried whenever we, you say that it is a submucus that is why it has been included in submucus now for type 0 and 7 medical diameter less than or equal to 10 percent of mean diameter mean you take the diameter of your myoma at three places and take out a mean and diameter of the pedicle should be less than or equal to 10 percent of this mean diameter then you say it is type 0 or type 7. to differentiate between type 2 and 3 hysteroscopic lowest filling pressure is required how much is the lowest filling pressure is required to visualize the endometrium here normal pressure is 60 to 80 mmhg those who are doing hysteroscopic surgeries or who are who have observed must have must be aware that this filling pressure is the pressure by which uh, helps us to visualize the uh, uterine lining or endometrium and normally it is up to 60 to 80 in the range of 60 to 80 mmhg more pressure will be required whenever the myometrial thickness is more or myometrial tone is more so that more pressure will be required in type 3 as there is an increase in myometrial thickness as compared to type 2. So, this is a new addition in the 2018 modification. How much uh, that I couldn't get, how much is the pressure in 3 and how much is in 2, but only this mention I got. Any postgraduate student who gets to know how much exactly uh, the pressure is when you say it is 3 and how much the pressure when to say 2, please let me know in the comments. Then to differentiate between 4 and 5, serosal distortion uh, is seen in type 5 and which will be identified with the help of ultrasonography or MRI. Further modifications which are suggested in 2018 uh, uh, revision are, uh, in whenever there is a leomyoma, total uh, uterine volume total uterine volume should be mentioned 
either by a ultra, uh, trans abdominal sonography, trans vaginal, or by with the help of MRI. If no, uh, none of these is available, then at least uterine size in wicks of gestation should be mentioned. Number of leomyoma should be mentioned in the report, one, two, three, four, or more than four. Location should also be uh, mentioned, such as whether it is anterior or posterior, whether it is right, left, or center. Also in vertical plane, whether it is in the upper half, lower half, or occupying both the halves. Volume of four leomyomas at least should be mentioned. And if there are more than four, then volume of the largest one should be mentioned. So these are the mandatory reporting guidelines given for ultrasonography or for the MRI based reporting whenever there is a AUBL or leomyoma. Coming to AUBM, M is malignancy as well as hyperplasia. So, Sub-classification of endometrial hyperplasia is same as has been suggested by WHO in 2014. There are only two types now, endometrial hyperplasia without atypia and endometrial hyperplasia with atypia. This endometrial hyper, hyperplasia with atypia is also called as endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia or EIA. Leomyosarcoma is also included under EUBM and carcinoma endometrium FIGO staging 2023 that, that has been unaltered as far as EUBM goes. So what is this FIGO uh, staging 2023? Here I have shown diagrammatically and so that it is easier for us to remember. Now always we used to say stage 1 uh, will be whenever the um, carcinoma endometrium is limited to the body of uterus. But here, stage 1 is again divided into 1A, 1B, 1C. These are the three. And remember that for stage 1A also, there are three, 1, 2, and 3. So main are three, 1A, 1B, 1C. And for 1A, there are further 1, 2, 3 divisions. One is there is uh, NA is non-aggressive type, histopathological type, and it is either involving endometrium or a polyp. Two is non-aggressive, but less than 50% involvement of the myometrium. And three is whenever there is an endometroid carcinoma, which is low grade, and it has a separate presence in ovary also. So there is an endometrioid type of carcinoma endometrium as well as endometrioid carcinoma of the ovary. Then it, it will be stage 1A3. What is 1B is non-aggressive but involving the myometrium to more than or equal to 50%. And whenever it is aggressive tumor and there is either even there is no involvement of myometrium, it will come 1C. So for C, always remember it is related to the uh, aggressive type. What is 2A is uh, involvement of the cervical stroma when it is a non-aggressive tumor. What is 2B is there is a major involvement of lymphovascular space invasion is present. Then it is 2B. And whenever it is an aggressive type, then it is 2C. And it is involving the myometrium. Aggressive type, type not involving myometrium is 1C. And involving the myometrium to any extent, that is 2C. So that is how you can remember the difference that 1C and 2C both are having aggressive type of a histopathological variant such as serosal tumor or a clear cell tumor. These are the aggressive types, unclassified one. These are the aggress aggressive types of endometrial carcinoma. 3A is adnexal uh, involvement. 3B is either vagina or pelvic peritoneal involvement and 3C is lymph node involvement, paraortic or pelvic lymph nodes. 4 is bladder or rectal mucosal involvement, 4B is extra pelvic peritoneum and 4C will be distant metastasis. What has been suggested is always to add, if feasible, molecular, molecular classification also. So whenever we are writing the staging and if the facilities are available, Molecular classification should also be noted. And what is mainly there is whether it is aggressive or non-aggressive histopathological type of a tumor and how much is a lymphovascular space invasion. So these are the three factors, molecular classification, LVSI, that is lymphovascular space invasion, and whether it is an aggressive or non-aggressive type of the tumor.
coming to AUBC coagulopathy, it includes systemic disorders of hemostasis and out of which most common is one millibrand. If we do the investigations in all patients of AUB, then in 13% we get biochemical evidence of AUBC. How much it contributes, we are not very sure, but it might contribute to the abnormal uterine bleeding. So there is a UBC screen. That means if it is positive, then we should do the complete coagulation profile. If there is a heavy menstrual bleeding since menarche, then one should go for that complete coagulation profile. The second is any one of PPH, surgical bleed or dental bleed. And third is more than or equal to two of bruising, epistaxis, gum bleeding or positive family history. So this table also all the postgraduates must remember. As far as 2018 goes, whenever a patient is on anticoagulants and drugs and she has AUB, it comes under AUBI. Previously, 2011, it was included under AUBC, but any drug which has been given anticoagulant, then that will be included under AUB iatrogenic. I. AUBO, that is ovulatory dysfunction. Either it can be annulation or loop events in menopausal transition. All the postgraduate uh, students should know what is loop. It is a luteal out of phase event. Luteal out of phase event where follicular recruitment takes place in luteal phase itself. Normally it takes place in early follicular phase, but here it takes place in luteal phase and ovulation takes place either during menstruation or just after menstruation. And that is why there are hormonal changes where there is an excess estrogen which leads to heavy menstrual bleeding. That is a common history which is seen, loop event which is seen in menopausal transition or perimenopausal age group. Now, AUB O is the most common cause of AUB. And usually there are underlying endocrinopathies responsible for ovulatory dysfunction such as PCOS, thyroid dysfunction, hyperprolactinemia, even hypothalamic functional uh, reasons such as stress, excessive emotional, physical stress. That also might be leading to uh, HPO axis dysfunction and resulting in ovulatory dysfunction. Usually infrequent irregular cycles with prolonged and heavy menstrual bleeding are suggestive of ovulatory dysfunction. Now, what has been introduced latest by FIBO is a new FIBO classification system for AUBO, which came in 2022. What is this? It, what has been suggested by this FIBO ovulatory disorder classification 2002 is causes of uh, ovulatory dysfunction can be summarized by a, um, this uh, acronym, which is HYPO-P, HYPO-P. Uh, HY is for hypothalamus, P is for pituitary, O is for ovarian, and uh, dash P, that next P is for PCOS. So here what has been recognized is ovulatory dysfunction, either it can be because of disturbance at hypothalamic level, pituitary level, or ovarian level. And PCOS is, as we have seen in PCOS class, it is a heterogeneous disorder and we can't pinpoint where the problem is. Some patients might be having hyperandrogenism, some patients might be having hyperinsulinemia as a main contributing factor and that is how it is a heterogeneous disorder and that is why it has, it is not possible to put it in any of these three and that is why there is a separate type 4 is given for PCOS. Now for, for these three, there is a level 2 subclassification which goes by the acronym gain fit by which is genetic, autoimmune, hydrogenic. Neoplasia, functional, infectious, trauma, physiological, idiopathic, and endocrine. So, gain, gain, fit, pi, that you remember. And level 3 is whatever is a specific condition, it should be mentioned in bracket. These are the three examples I have given to you. Now, the, see, this is type 1 means there is a problem at hypothalamic level. F is it is functional and specific disorder is anorexia nervosa. Type 2 is problem is at pituitary level. N is there is a neoplasia and there is a presence of pituitary adenoma, which is responsible for ovulatory dysfunction. Type 3 is problem is at the level of ovary. There is an endocrinal problem and the patient has hypothyroidism leading to ovulatory dysfunction. And type 4 will never have this secondary and tertiary uh, level to level 3. It will only be mentioned as PCOS. So this is FIGO. Ovulatory Disorder Classification 2022 with a 
acronym HYPO-P. AUB is endometrial disorders. AUB, whenever there is a AUB with normal ovulatory cycles, regular cycles, and still there is a AUB, then usually the it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Whenever regular cycles are there, but there is a heavy menstrual bleeding and or prolonged bleeding and no other cause is found, then we suspect it is a diagnosis, diagnosis uh, is uh, even as a UBE. Unfortunately, there are no specific tests to measure these endometrial uh, the primary disturbances of hemostasis in the endometrium. So what disturbances are there? Either there is a for, uh, decrease in uh, vasoconstrictors, rise in vasodilators, or increase in plasminogen activity in the uterine cavity. So vasoconstrictors are endothelin 1 and prostaglandin F2 alpha. Vasodilators which are more in amount are prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline that is I2. And pl increased plasminogen activity leads to increased clot lysis of the menstrual uh, blood and that clot lysis is responsible for heavy menstrual bleeding. AUBI is iatrogenic, where either patient uh, has AUB because of certain medications or intrauterine system. Whenever it is a LNG IUS, then breakthrough bleeding is usually uh, is seen in some of the patients for first six months. There are three groups of medications. First are the medic med uh, drugs which are directly acting on endometrium. Second group is anticoagulants and third are affecting the ovulation. Directly acting on endometrium are steroids such as estrogen, progestogen, or androgen. All these are, uh, whenever there is abnormal bleeding, it is called as unscheduled bleeding or breakthrough bleeding. Now, whenever uh, there is cyclical treatment is being given, such as cyclically progestogens or estrogen progestogen combination is given, and if in between patient has intermenstrual bleeding, then we call it as unscheduled. If what we expect is aminuria, such as patient is on DMPA, in that any time she has bleeding, it will be considered as a breakthrough or unscheduled bleeding. Breakthrough bleeding and unscheduled bleeding, these are the terminologies with the same meaning. Affecting coagulation, drugs affecting coagulation, such as warfarin, heparin, or uh, the newer one, uh, which is rivaroxaban, all these, if this patient is taking this and she has a UB, that will come under AUB I, that is iatrogenic. Third group is affecting ovulation, tricyclic antidepressants or phenothiazines. They affect dopamine and serotonin uptake uh, is affected adversely. And there is hyperprolactinemia, which leads to anovulation and AUB. Now, why there is breakthrough bleeding whenever a patient is taking estrogen or progestogens? Either there is a non-compliance, she is taking it with along with antibiotics, certain antibiotics or anticonvulsants, or if patient is a smoker, then there is accelerated hepatic clearance of these steroids, and that leads to the abnormal uterine bleeding. So when, whenever there is breakthrough bleeding, we need to rule out these causes of breakthrough bleeding. If you are asked what are the causes of breakthrough bleeding when your patient is on OCPs or progestogens. Then non-compliance, either as the patient is taking along with antibiotics or anticonvulsants, or patient is a smoker. AUBN is now called as not otherwise classified in 2018. It was previously called as not yet classified. All these conditions are either poorly defined or inadequately examined. Examples are arteriovenous malformations, myometrial hypertrophy, Isthmocele or niche at lower uterine or upper cervical part in a case of uh, previous caesarean section is a new entity which has been recognized and it might be the contributing factor or one of the cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. Thank you so much. Next class we will see AUB3 that is management of AUB.